By the evening of April the 10th, the Titanic arrived at her first port of call, Cherbourg, France. The villagers of the seaside town were in awe with the ship resting on the waters, whose lights were casting dancing shadows across the way. As twilight settled, the Titanic raised anchors and headed for the final European call, Queenstown, Ireland. On April the 11th, the ship docked outside of the city, while the last of the steerage passengers boarded tenders to the ship. It was here that a middle-aged man walked off of the second-class decks and boarded a returning tender with a camera in his hand. His name was Father Francis Brown, and he was arriving in Ireland to begin missionary work. As the Titanic raised anchors and began to steam away, Father Brown captured the moment on film. Unknown to the man, or to the rest of the world, this would become the final photograph ever taken of the Titanic. Sunday, April the 14th. It began like all the other days prior, except for the newer chill of the era. Church services were held in the dining saloon and ended with the hymn, Eternal Father, Strong to Save, which closes with the prophetic ending, for those in peril in the sea. By mid-afternoon, the weather was so cold that the decks were almost vacant. As twilight settled, a few passengers braved the 30-degree weather just to witness a spectacular sunset on the open sea as the sky was painted by a thin crimson surrounded by varying shades of purple and blue. Alas for Titanic and for many of her passengers, this would be the last time that they would see the light of day. At 11.40 p.m., lookout Frederick Fleet spotted a dark object on the horizon looming directly in the Titanic's path. He rang the ship's bell three times and telephoned the bridge. What did you see? Sixth Officer Moody asked. Iceberg right ahead, Fleet answered. Moody relayed the message to First Officer Murdoch, who was in command at the time. Murdoch had less than 30 seconds to make a choice. Using instinct, he ordered the ship turn hard to starboard with the engines full speed astern. For a few fleeting seconds, all eyes were on the iceberg as it slowly began to drift away while Titanic made her turn. Then, somewhere down below, there came a sudden shock, followed by a grinding sound as part of the berg pierced the lower compartments of the ship. <clears throat> Ten seconds later, it was over. Murdoch ordered the engines shut down. Now the massive liner sat motionless on a vast, open, and frigid sea. Captain Smith returned to the bridge to inquire of what had happened. Murdoch informed him of the situation, nervous but still collected manner. Fourth Officer Boxhall did a brief inspection below decks and reported everything okay and no apparent damage. The telephone rang, and this time it was the crew stationed in the Orlop deck. They reported that the mail room had flooded, and boiler rooms 6 and 5 were flooding. Captain Smith had Thomas Andrews go below and check the damage. Andrews returned 20 minutes later with glazed eyes and beads of sweat on his brow. According to his calculations, based on the rate of the damage and of the flooding, the Titanic would sink within an hour. Both Andrews and Smith knew that the 20 lifeboats on board could carry only 1,100 of the 2,228 passengers. Captain Smith ordered them swung out and loaded the women and children in to be lowered and rowed as quickly as possible. The passengers were mustered onto the boat deck. Many of them objected to being woken up in the middle of such a cold night. The crew members had a difficult time convincing them of the perilous situation. Everyone knew that the mighty Titanic was unsinkable. The newspaper said so. The first bite lifeboat left shortly after 1 a.m. All of the lifeboats were designed to carry 65 people. This one left with 12. Around 1.15 a.m., the mood on board began to change as the seawater now started flooding into passenger areas of the ship. There were moments of terror as lifeboats became less in amount, while the crowds continued to gather on deck. 
the Strausses refused to separate from each other and chose to die together. Benjamin Guggenheim changed into a tuxedo and told a crew member that he planned to go down and die as a gentleman. As the boats left, Thomas Andrews urged the passengers to climb into them without haste until at last all the lifeboats were gone. It is now 2 a.m. The 1,500 people left on board the Titanic have now come to terms and realized that within minutes they were going to die. Wallace Hartley, who led the Titanic's band, changed the tune from ragtime to the hymn, Nearer My God to Thee, as the water surged up the boat deck. Meanwhile, the massive stern climbed higher into the darkened sky. Father Thomas Biles gathered a group of passengers together at the fantail, where he heard their confessions and led them in prayer as the ship plunged deeper. There was the sound of gunshots as an officer committed suicide. Captain Smith entered the bridge and was last seen gazing into the, out to the lifeboats in the water. A massive wave surged over the forward section of the ship, shattering the dome over the grand staircase, while the forward funnel ripped loose from its moorings and collapsed. Finally, as if she wanted to conceal the horrors on the decks, the Titanic's lights flashed and then faded off. <clears throat> there was a massive explosion as the mighty lighter broke in half. The stern fell to the sea and leveled out then slowly rose into the sky once more until it was almost completely vertical. Slow at first, but gaining speed, the remains of the greatest ship in the world slid into the dark depths of the Atlantic. At 2.20 in the morning of April the 15th, it was over. The Titanic surrendered herself to the sea and sank. The only remainder of what was were 20 lifeboats shining pale white in the darkness. But those in the boats became victims as well, as they heard the pleas and the screams of help that would never arrive. For those that were stranded in the water, death came quickly. Within 15 minutes, there was an eerie silence that fell across the scene. And soon, passengers in the rowboats began to question where their loved ones were. Others wondered of the fate of Thomas Andrews, the man who designed and built the Titanic, who now all had claimed her to be unsinkable and then turned around and retracted the thought to doom her. He was last seen sitting in the smoking room in a state of shock with his life jacket cast against the opposite table. As morning broke, the RMS Carpathia arrived and picked up 705 survivors. It was shortly after noon that the greatest ordeal was about to occur. As the last lifeboat was unloaded, many women now realized they had become widows. Mrs. Eloise Smith, a young woman from first class, must have felt horrendous shock. Her husband, Lucian, had booked the Titanic as a memorable way of ending their honeymoon. During the night, he placed her into a lifeboat and kissed her goodbye and went down with the ship. A pale Bruce Ismay was carried aboard. As one of the last lifeboats left the Titanic, he jumped into it. He was the president of the White Star Line and the man who said that the ship should be built. His choice of jumping into the boat would become a decision that would haunt him for the rest of his life. And thus, as the Carpathia began to steam to New York, survivors gave thanks and prayed for the lost souls as they steamed over the newly settled grave of the Titanic. A chapter in the great book of life has ended, and many new ones were about to begin. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor to present to you a very good friend of mine, Miss Angelica Harris.